Pastor, please come and bring us the word. We'll be in John 7 this morning. Gospel of John, chapter 7. still singing. Amen. Amen. Well, the kids were singing today, weren't they? They were. Amen. 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 Evidently, they know count your blessings. <laughs> They're the now generation. That's right. You can't say that enough. <laughs> you can be righteous as a child. We saw that at Teen Sunday School today with the illustration of King Josiah who had a wicked father and a wicked grandfather, but the Bible says that he walked in the way of David, his father. He was righteous. And young people can serve God and be effective tools to be used by God. And it's just incredible how God can take a child and just use their hearts and use them for each other kids. And we don't have to wait until they grow up for them to be the future. They're the now. They're the present. And so thank God for the kids that we have in our church. And I just pray that we get a lot more. I tell you, it, it grieves my heart to pick up kids from the public schools during the day. And while I'm watching thousands of kids come out, I'm thinking, man, we're influencing so few. <coughs> and socialism and, and uh, the world's philosophy is influencing so many. We just want to reach our children. So you meet kids, man, bring them to church. And you see kids, you be like, that's a kid. Uh, and I'm going to get him in church. If you have kids in your, in your neighborhood or anywhere, uh, pastor who is in, in many ways a mentor to me, Dr. Richard Schermerhorn, I always am amazed at the way he sees teenagers. He's, it's almost like they're like gold bars or something, you know, like if you love gold. And he'd be like, oh, there's a teenager. And any time he meets a teenager, well, who's that teenager? Where'd that teenager come from? I mean, he, gets, he used to get them all in his youth group, all of them in his church, and just impacted so many lives. And you could do that as well, man, if you uh, have nieces and nephews. And kids, bring them to church. And, you know, so many Christians are worried about, I see articles by Barna and so forth about, you know, the, the young folks are leaving the church. That isn't so in our church. Young folks are coming in our church. And they're growing up and becoming adults. And they're not leaving the church even when they move away. They're, they're growing up and serving the Lord in other places. And so let's impact the next generation. That'll make a huge difference. Are you in John chapter 7? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, then let's read the first verse, and then let's go down to the last paragraph, or the last two paragraphs, which would begin in verse 40, and read on into chapter 8. So, you ready? After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. And now verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among them because of him, and some of them would have taken him. But no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Mm. Then answered them, uh, the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto him, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answer and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Verse 1 of chapter 8, he, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, and he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What says thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. 
So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So, Father, as we are in this portion of the Gospel of John that shows us how we can know that Jesus is the Christ and that we might believe on Him. Help us to look in particular at how some did not believe and how others such as this woman did believe. And Lord, as we do that, help us to be introspective. Help us to see our own hearts and our own need for the Savior. And then, God, I ask that you would help us to look outside of ourselves and see others the way that you see souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we see in our transition into chapter 8, we see that the popularity of the Lord Jesus is waning, so much so that He is spending His time in the regions of Galilee, which would have been where after He had been born in Bethlehem and then been in Egypt for a couple of years, Jesus had grown up. He'd grown up in Galilee and that had been the region that He was from. And there is a an interesting, uninformed conversation about a prophet arising out of Galilee, which is completely hypocritical about Jesus. I love reading that portion of the Scripture for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I like seeing follow-up on Nicodemus, the man that came to Jesus by night. We saw Nicodemus a, a few weeks ago, and one of the things that we learned was, first of all, how simple the Gospel is and we, we heard the gospel simply from the Lord Jesus Himself. And Jesus explained the gospel by, by helping to understand that every person needs to be born spiritually. Without spiritual birth, no one goes to the kingdom of God, including religious rulers and Pharisees like Nicodemus. You must be born again. And then Jesus explained the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, he explained using the illustration of Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. I don't know what it must have been like to have been one of the twelve to have witnessed, as John evidently did, this encounter with Nicodemus. But can you imagine how confusing or what a conundrum the serpent in the wilderness until Jesus used it for an illustration must have been up to this point? The serpent in the wilderness, to me, is like, well, isn't the serpent symbolic of the Satan? Isn't it? You know, and why would God tell the children of Israel when they're bitten by a poisonous serpent to lift a serpent up? King Hezekiah destroyed the serpent because it became an idol that people worshipped. And so it must have been a little bit confusing. And then the aha moment when Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I can imagine being like John saying, that's what that meant. That's what that meant. Sin had to be nailed to the cross. And when you look at the cross where Jesus Christ shed His blood, see, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So Jesus is what's lifted up. And just like the people looked at the serpent and lived, that's faith. That's how you believe in Jesus. By looking to the cross. And that's how simple the Gospel is. God doesn't add anything to the Gospel. Men add to the Gospel. <clears throat> Boy, there are books written complicating the Gospel uh, to, to the point where I wouldn't know how to believe it. I couldn't pray the right sinner's prayer. You just assemble for yourself a list of gospel tracts and take all of the aspects of the sinner's prayer in each of them and you'll be confused about the gospel. But you read John chapter 3 where Jesus said, look to me. Look to me and be born again. And then he just, he summarized it in such a simple way by saying, he that believeth is not condemned. 
He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. And now we're in a portion of the Gospel of John where we are seeing examples of how people came to Jesus, how they believed in Jesus. So Nicodemus would have been one of the first of them. Uh, we saw a man who was born lame and how he believed in Jesus. We saw the Samaritans and the woman at the well and how they believed in Jesus. And now we're seeing mixed into the, each of John's examples of the gospel being preached to individuals. We're seeing mixed into those examples how people didn't believe in Jesus as well. And that ought to clarify for us even more what the gospel is and how to know the gospel. And so the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief rulers, not all of them, but they refused to believe in Jesus. They refused to receive Jesus. And it was not because the information that they had was different or because they were too intellectual or too well informed to believe in Jesus. It was because of a heart's attitude, an unwillingness to receive Jesus. And it really is cloaked in these two accounts that John shares of the Gospel here. It's cloaked in this snide comment that they make to the officers that wouldn't, wouldn't arrest Jesus because they said, never man spake like this man, and to this man Nicodemus. And the question or the statement they made was summarized like this. You know, intelligent people don't believe in Jesus. You know, anyone who is a scribe or a Pharisee or a ruler, none of them, check and see, none of them believe. And Nicodemus is sitting here going, <laughs> right? And he said, ah, oh. you, you, you see it? I mean, that's, that's the encounter here at the end of, of John 7. It's they're like, well, you know, um, nobody that is anybody believes. Look at, look at uh, uh, verse 40, uh, 47. They're, they're, they're talking down to the officers. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Now, are, are you stupid? Are you deceived? I mean, has any have any of us believed on him? You know, as in, unless we do it, you know, everyone else is a dunderhead. You know, they just, anybody know what a dunderhead is? Okay, you're free to use it. It's not my own word, but it's one that I'm trying to bring back into circulation a little bit. Uh, but uh, you, you feel free to use it all you like to on Charlie, but anyone else will get their feelings hurt. Okay, so anyway, but I mean, do you see any of us believing? You know, I said, we're the elite, we're the intelligentsia, and if you don't do what we do, you are just nothing. And when they're saying this, there's a guy sitting there with them named Nicodemus. Do any of us believe in Nicodemus is probably looking at the officers going, some of us do. <laughs> you see it? I, mean, I can just see it as plate of the nose on your face. And it's interesting, Nicodemus isn't silent here. He, he could just sit by and just be part of the crowd, but he isn't. He, he speaks up. And he said something. He said, um, Doth our law judge any man before he hear him and know what he doeth? You guys are talking about the law. You're talking like you know everything. But let me ask you a question about our law. Do we arrest people before they've committed a crime or done anything wrong? And now they're looking at Nicodemus saying, You know, you shouldn't have said that. You're supposed to be one of us. And then they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? <laughs> and I could just see Nicodemus just looking at him. And, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Now there's two arguments that they're making to try to convince people not to believe in Jesus. The first argument is intelligent people don't believe in God. <clears throat> And that's the equivalent of it today, isn't it? Yes. I mean, that's the equivalent of it. Intelligent people don't believe in God. And my simple answer to that is everybody believes in God. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. 
everybody believes in God. And so, trying to put people down or, you know, make them feel ignorant or intimidated, it's a tactic to silence people, but it doesn't deal with the facts. And the fact is that Jesus is God. Amen. Secondly, the second statement was, you know, search the Scripture. Is there a prophet arising out of Galilee? Well, friend, do your self the favor of searching a little bit yourself because you're exposing your ignorance and closed-mindedness. There were some fellows from all the way out of the East that followed a star because they searched the Scriptures. And they went to Jerusalem and they said, Where is He that is born King of the Jews? For we've seen His star in the East and are come seeking Him. And Herod said, huh? And they asked the people that knew the Scripture, and they said, well, they said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And the wise men went to Bethlehem. <laughs> and there he was. So did the prophet arise from Galilee? Well, he grew up in Galilee, but he was from Bethlehem. And then read Hosea 11. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And after Herod makes his threat and murders all the babies under two years of age and younger, Jesus is surviving in Egypt. And if you want to search something, just go check it out. Because the facts speak for themselves, for thanking people. Isn't it incredible how closed-minded people claim to be open-minded? Closed-minded. No individual has ever searched the Scripture and come to the conclusion that one, Jesus did not exist, or two, that Jesus was not God. Countless individuals like Nicodemus with open minds <clears throat> have searched the Scriptures and found that Jesus is the Son of God. And they found that He is the means for eternal life with the validation of the witness of the Holy Spirit of God that comes in us when we receive Him. Amen. And that's a fact. And then, let me challenge you. I've read the Scripture a few times myself, the ones they're referencing. Show me where the Scripture says that a prophet has to come from a certain city. Nahum, farmer from Tekoa. Where does it say that a prophet has to be a priest or a Levite or anything other than one that God raises up who is validated by what? What validates a prophet? What? Okay, one, what he says comes to pass, and two, what he says comes from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Well, friend, Jesus fulfilled every prophecy of the Scripture with regard to the Messiah, and anyone who searches the Scriptures will discover that so. And here are individuals with their pious arrogance saying, hey, you know, check the Bible, it doesn't say. They don't have a clue what the Bible says. I know they don't know it at all. Friend, unbelief is one of the most arrogant, ignorant attitudes any person can have. And these individuals literally are making a mockery out of themselves to any thinking person. Why? Well, because their motivation is unbelief. And so we have a admixture of that. Now, chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus walked no more in Jewry. Why? Because the Jews sought to kill Him. And then, the end of chapter 7, we see an example of unbelief. Then we find it carried out in a contrasting category where a woman taken in adultery and these pious individuals who are so conscientious about the law bring her to Jesus to see if He'll contradict the law. That's where we find ourselves. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives teaching His disciples and then He went into the temple and He sat down and people are coming around Him and He is teaching the people. While He's teaching the people, I, I suspect with some commotion, I suspect with, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, some pomp and circumstance, they bring this woman in to the midst interrupt Jesus' teaching, interrupt His reaching the people, and say, this woman was taken in adultery 
in the very act. We don't need to spend much time on what the scripture here doesn't say. Sometimes, and matter of fact, most of the times that I hear this passage of scripture preached, I hear more time and more emphasis on what is not said than on what the scripture plainly says. I'm fine if you have a lazy afternoon with nothing to think about to ponder what Jesus may have written on the ground. But the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote on the ground, and so therefore it must not be significant enough for the Holy Spirit of God to make that the point of the passage, okay? So a lot of people say, well, he wrote the names of the people on the ground. You have no idea whether that's what he wrote. Well, he wrote the law on the ground so that every sin that every person there had committed would see their sin as he wrote it on the ground. Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but the Holy Spirit didn't see fit to emphasize that. And so let's don't spend too much time there Amen. today. That isn't the point of the Scripture. I fear sometimes for the purpose of sensationalizing a sensational book that we embellish things that aren't there and we ignore the things which are. So let's look at the things which are. There's an example of belief and there's an example of unbelief in this passage of Scripture. And that's what is plainly laid forth for us to take example from or to find an example from in the Scripture here. So this woman is set in the midst and she's accused and she's told uh, she's guilty and she's guilty by the law. There are enough witnesses and this is what the law says. And in Jesus' perspective, the question is what are you going to do? Let's talk about the implications of the question. What did Jesus have the right to do if He wasn't God? Stone him. Stone him. If He wasn't God? If He wasn't God. Oh, if He wasn't God. Do you, do you, do you see the contradiction here? You're bringing a person for judgment to someone that you're claiming isn't a rightful judge. It's ironic, isn't it? So what's implied in that? You know he's the rightful judge, you just think that you're going to get him to make a right decision and it won't be popular. That's all. Uh, we do live in an age, don't we, where when the prophets said, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, we live in that age today, don't we? Yes. We have a convoluted morality today. Mm -hmm. Today the high morality is accepting anything that is offensive to God. And the immoral thing is holding to anything that's offensive to God. I'm not promoting him. I'm not saying I'm a big fan of him, but I appreciate Franklin Graham's tweet last week about the politician. When he said, you know, God says homosexuality is a sin, and you shouldn't be running on that if you're claiming to be a believer. That is an exact quote. But he says, you know, if God says it's wicked, that's nothing for you to be proud of. And I appreciate Franklin Graham saying, you know, God says that's wicked. And he may have caught some flack for it last week, but I suspect as well that righteous people appreciate somebody verbalizing something that needed to be said. Mm -hmm. And uh, appreciate that from him. Well, here are individuals that are coming to the judge. Make no mistake, Jesus is the judge. Coming to the judge and saying, let's see your judgment on this one. Here's the law. And they make their case. <clears throat> Evidently, obviously from the context, Jesus cannot here make a right judgment that would be popular. He can't make it, you know, there's, there's just no way he could answer it right. Remember the whole, you know, should we pay taxes to the Roman government? It's just, you know, Jesus gave a good answer. And here he gives a good answer, but they just don't think that he can give the right answer and not get in trouble for it. And so they're just trying to trap him. It's entrapment. You go ahead and stone this one. We'll see how that goes. Probably, probably with the situation, the circumstances being what they were, the uh, very, very complicated admixture of the Jewish law that they were allowed to enforce along with being under Roman law, they probably didn't have the right to put a woman to death and stone her. So had Jesus stoned this woman or caused her to be stoned, then the Roman government would have come down on Him. Uh, had He forgiven her, then they could say, 
well, he did forgive her, but had he said, you know what, we're not going to stone her, we're not going to apply the law here, then they would have said that he contradicted his own law, the Word of God, and that he, was, he couldn't be God and contradict his own law. There's no right response unless you're Jesus. And here again we find the wisdom of our Savior. Jesus doesn't answer. And while He's not answering, evidently different individuals go out. We could certainly, I think, and accurately assume they went out because of the answer Jesus gave. And that was, okay, you know what? We're going to enforce the law. I need some perfect people here to do it. You? You? We need somebody. Here's a big rock. And I want when I find the perfect person, I mean, I want the first rock to just knock her out. You know, just smash her face with it. Okay, who are you perfect? You perfect? You? You? And as he gazes upon each individual in the room and says, Administer righteousness, will you please, righteous one? They go out one by one. Yeah, you know, I I think it should be done, but you know, I, I it's one of those somebody ought to do something things. And and nobody does anything. No one does anything. They go out one by one. And Jesus looks up from writing on the ground. And she's the only one that hasn't gone out. Think of the implications here. I think she certainly could have gone out. When the last person left, there are those individuals who have made would have probably tried to make their escape. Jesus wasn't holding her there. But she was there because she saw a justice. She saw a righteousness. She saw something that was different than her accusers. She saw the Son of God. And he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath any man condemned thee? No man, Lord. And Jesus said, Well, then neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus is different from any human justice, from any human judge, because He had the right to be judged in the place of the sinner. And therefore, He had the right to forgive a sinner. Here, John is giving us a snapshot, and a very clear one, that is implying that Jesus has the right to give forgiveness of sins because He is sinless. And so he can say, go and sin no more. You know, if Pastor Price were to say, go and sin no more, you could just follow that rascal for a week and say, you don't have any right to tell me that. And the same for any other person here. The individuals follow Jesus for his entire life, and in particular, for his entire ministry. And though they sought occasion to accuse Him, they found none because He was a sinless Son of God. And when His time was come, He walked into Jewry to be crucified. He went into Jerusalem to die there as a sinless Savior as we saw last week for sinners. And so when Jesus looks at these individuals, and some of them are accusers, though themselves unrighteous, and He looks at a woman who is accused, He's willing to give her His righteousness. And here we find another example of how people come to Jesus. Think of the manner in which Nicodemus came. He came of his own will. And when he met Jesus... We see the testimony later of Nicodemus. Think of how the Samaritan woman came to Jesus. She happened on Him and was spoken to someone that she thought shouldn't have had anything to do with her. And when she challenged Him theologically, and she said, Our fathers worship in this mountain, but the Jews say we have to worship at Jerusalem, Jesus pulled no punches. He said, Salvation's of the Jews. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him, He may be a spirit, but He didn't say to worship Him in the mountain. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is, you're supposed to worship at Jerusalem. 
she received Jesus. When she received Jesus, the village of Samaria came to see the man that told her everything she ever did. And after they saw him, they said, Now we believe not because you've told us, but because we've seen him for ourselves. And we've received Jesus. You have so many examples in this portion of John that's written so that we can know that Jesus is the Christ and that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing we might have life through His name. And here's an example of a dear woman who was enslaved. We could call her all kinds of things, but it isn't necessary to do so. We could say she's a victim of her circumstance, but she was dragged into the presence of Jesus. And when given the opportunity to walk out, she remained and found forgiveness for sin. I appreciated the special today, the 90 and 9. I love it that Jesus goes out seeking His sheep. It isn't just a matter of anyone that wants to come into the fold, say the secret password and I'll let you in. It's a matter of there's one missing and I'm going to go find him. <clears throat> That's very personal for each of us, isn't it? Yeah. That God, who doesn't need us for anything, loves the ungodly and seeks them to save. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Hallelujah. And so in comes this woman dragged and placed in shame in front of everyone. And as each individual flees the presence of Jesus, she remains because He sought her. And she found forgiveness of sins that day. And friend, you don't need to have my testimony and I don't need yours, but our testimony for each of us needs to be that we found Jesus or that Jesus found us. And like this dear woman, when she found herself in the presence of God, she remained in His presence and there found forgiveness for sin. That's the kind of Savior Jesus is. God loves you very much. And as we conclude today, our natural conclusion ought to be that it is possible for us to be one of two. Individuals who, with the overwhelming witness of who Jesus is, come right in. There's room right here in the third row. Third row up. Come right in. Actually, right here. There's room right here. Come right up here. We'll need you up front anyway. Alright? So, in the presence of the Savior, seeing Jesus for who He is, individuals make the very, very conscious decision in their pride to reject Him. Why? Why does anyone reject Jesus? Is it honestly because they can't believe? No, it's because of a heart of unbelief. It's a choice. Is it because the Scriptures say that no prophecy prophet must ever come from Galilee? No, not at all. It is because they have hearts that are unwilling to believe. What about you? Here this morning. What about you? What would you say would be a description of yourself when you're brought into the presence of Jesus? Would you say, I want to believe in Jesus? Or would it be true for you that rather instead you'd say, you know something, I don't think He's... And you come up with a reason why not to. You know how all that is? It's dishonesty. Because Jesus is God. He's the Son of God and He's the only Savior. What would you do with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, thank You so much this morning for the privilege of being able to come into Your presence. And Lord, I just pray that the Gospel as You teach it and as You preach it, Lord, would be the Gospel that we've believed. If there'd be an individual here today that because of unbelief finds fault in a faultless Savior. Lord, may You show us with plain conviction the hypocrisy of that and the truth that Jesus is the only Savior. Now God, I just thank You so much that You are the shepherd that goes out seeking the lost sheep.
and that you love this woman that individuals were willing to just plunder and use for their own purpose and that you saved this woman. We praise you for being that kind of a Savior. We admire you and look to you, exalt you as a good God who is unlike any other. We say this in admiration and we thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we have a little bit of an unusual conclusion to our service today because we have some guests here. And I want to just invite you, but before we do that, let me say a couple of words uh, about, our, about our church's invitation. Oftentimes we do an invitation at the end of the service where we sing a song and where individuals are invited to respond. But one of the benefits of a church this size is that the invitation is actually very, very personal. If you're here today and you don't know that Jesus is your Savior, that you have eternal life, I would be available for you immediately following the service to be able to open a Bible and to help you to have confidence, know based on what God says that you have eternal life and that you can never lose it. And so that is the invitation for you here today. The second part of the invitation today would be for believers. And that part of the invitation would be, how do you see people? Do you see people the way the Pharisees and scribes do? Do you look at the sins of others as a way of justifying yourself? Or do you look at sinners the way Jesus does and see an individual that is perfectly within your ability to save because of your own sacrifice? And Jesus became that woman on the cross for Jesus Christ. And she got His righteousness. God can save anyone. Is that how you look at people? And that ought to be our attitude toward the lost. Uh, I want to ask our guests today. We have uh, Brother Enoch and we, we have uh, Ansi. Enoch and Nancy, and then baby uh, uh, Nate. Is it Nehow? Nehow? Nehow. Baby Nehow. Why don't you guys come up here real quickly? Just come stand right by me. Uh, God has blessed them with a baby boy. And uh, last week they called me and they said, You know, Pastor, we'd like to have, uh, we'd like to have you baptize our baby. And so we met last week, and of course, a baby can't make a decision to be baptized. But when a parent is being spoken to by God, and he is showing, God is showing them what a blessing it is to be given a child to raise. And what a responsibility as a parent it is to be able to instruct them to know who God is and to be raised to know who God is. Well, that's a, that is a vital responsibility. And God has shown them something. God's put something in their heart saying, you know something? We want our child to know Jesus. We want our child to know God. And this is going to be a journey for them. They're going to have to grow as well in order to be able to raise their child to know Jesus Christ. And so we had this conversation last week. Proverbs 22, 6, I believe is the Word of God, don't you? And Proverbs 22, 6 says this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And so we're going to have with you as witnesses a little bit of a dedication ceremony here for Nehow. Nahal. Nahal. I wish I could say it. It sounds like Nahal, but Nahal. All right. I'll do better later, I promise. Okay. So we're going to have a dedication for him. If you stay here, I would just like to pray with them and give you guys a little bit of a charge of the responsibility of raising a child for the Lord Jesus. In order to raise your child to know the Lord Jesus, of course, that means that you're going to have to grow in your faith as well. And a vital part of that is being invested in a family like this one of individuals that could teach you the Word of God and to help you to grow spiritually. And that is the only way that he is going to be raised to know Jesus is to be raised by his parents' example. And so this is a grave responsibility. This is a big deal. And God is the giver of life. Before this baby was formed in the womb, God knew him, just like God knew you. And so I'm going to pray today that God would raise this young man up and grow his parents as well so that at a very early age, first of all, he can know eternal life. And then I'm going to pray and ask God uh, that he would give you as parents wisdom to grow. And then we as a church want to help you. We want to, uh, I want to charge our church with the responsibility when God sends people to us that he's put something in their hearts, then it's our responsibility to help and instruct them. If you're here today and you're parents and you know how to raise a child and to teach them to know the Lord, 
these are folks that could use your help and you could invest in their lives as well. And so let's pray. If you would, if you would let me, can I hold him? Why don't you hold this and I'll hold him if it won't wake him up. I hope he doesn't wake up and say, oh, <laughs> watch babies cry when I hold him. Okay. We're going to say a word of prayer. And I want to ask uh, Brother Charlie, if you'd come up as well, I'd like you to pray with us as well. Charlie's one of the leaders in our church. Yeah. He's snoring. <laughs> this is what some of y'all can be doing about 25 minutes. <laughs> Don't do it until you get home. All right. Would they? Are you going to ask them to be uh, to be the godparents? Yeah. Okay. All right. Tell me your name. Steve. Steve. Okay. Mm -hmm. Steve. Okay. Lily. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's pray for this family, shall we? And then Charlie, I'm going to ask you to pray as well. God, the gift of life is such a precious thing. So many individuals are given children and they don't realize that they are a heritage from the Lord. And this young man, God, I'm praying right now that at a very early age that he would hear the gospel and know it. And that he'd receive Jesus as his Savior. I ask that you would I help his parents to raise him in such a way that he has a very, very tender heart to truth. God, I pray that you would give him the ability from your word to see evil and to see righteousness and to choose to be righteous. Lord, I ask that it would be evident from a very early age that you would place your call on this young man's life, that you'd use him. Lord, if, if I could have my way, and I think, I think this could please you, would you call him into the ministry to preach the gospel to the world? And Lord, I pray that you would give his parents wisdom. Help us as a church. God, we get so busy sometimes and we're so guilty sometimes of ignoring the most important things. Help us to invest in the life of this family. I pray for these individuals who are committing to this role in his life. Uh, I just ask that you would give them the wisdom that you would grow them first so they could be in samples. Lord, we thank you for the cross of Jesus that makes sinners perfect because they have your position as sons. And God, I thank you that you could just use people like us. Bless these parents. And God, encourage them. Put people in their way that would instruct them and challenge them. And then, God, I pray for our church. Lord, help us not to be irresponsible in this task that you have privileged us to have in helping these parents to raise a child to know Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. 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 Charlie? Charlie, pray for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you would, I just second Pastor's requests. I think in particular now uh, with Steve and uh, any other extended family members, Lord, uh, you'd give grace there. I pray in particular that you would uh, not only give wisdom uh, to the parents and to he as well, Lord, I pray as far as that, um, Lord, even now that you would work with regard to uh, sanctifying influence uh, in their heart, Lord, that they, they would have a uh, growing dissatisfaction uh, with this world, Lord, and that they would have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, very in particular, for now as well, Lord, that um, early on, Lord, that you uh, put a hedge of protection about him, Lord, that uh, he would not have uh, scars of tragedy of um, many young child, uh, many young children, uh, even his age, Lord, uh, that um, a lot in this community that Satan's really hard at work to destroy their lives. And so I pray, Father, that, um, Lord, you would, you, would, you would guard him, Lord, till, not just till, but uh, following um, him getting saved at an early age. And, Lord, I, I pray as well that um, you would just give him a heart of a soul winner, Lord, and that, um, Lord, he would be grow, he'd, uh, he'd be raised to be somebody that would be used mightily of you, Lord. And that, that he would influence many, uh, not just within his family, but also within his community as far as to know Christ and to live for Christ. And Lord, I pray for the, um, again, uh, for us as well, Lord, that we would be good examples and that uh, we would uh, not neglect our responsibility, Lord, in uh, seeking to live for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to be dismissed.
Uh, at this time, and yeah, once you guys stay up here, and we'll get a picture real quick. Shall I keep grabbing my phone from? I guess right on the podium there. I want to get a picture with you guys and with your uh, certificate as well. All right. You're dismissed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody get a picture of this baby not crying. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs>